Welcome, everyone. Thanks for joining. I'm Robin Bendergen, Executive Director of the OpenJS Foundation. And I always say I have the best job ever. I know many of you all think you have the best job ever, particularly at the LF, but I truly do. Um, I've got to work in open source and open standards communities for 16 years total of those 13 years on the Node.js project. Um, and I've been here at OpenJS for about four and a half years. I even see one of my old teammates. So, um, so we like to say at OpenJS, I start this with every presentation. Most people are using JavaScript whether they know it or not. It's in almost 99% of the world's websites. Um, and at OpenJS, we support 35 projects, but I like to say that we promote the JavaScript ecosystem as a whole. Uh, we do dearly love our 35, but um, our really our, our goal is to promote the widespread adoption um, of JavaScript broadly and web technologies as well. And JavaScript really, it is really mission critical. It's used NASA to Netflix. It's used in AI. It's used in the metaverse. You really can't do anything in the world without JavaScript. Um, and it continues to be the number one programming language in almost all surveys from Redmonk, uh, GitHub, um, and others. So just a step back and taking a look at some of those near and dear 35 projects of ours. We have um, Appium, uh, Jest, Node.js, Webpack, ESLint, jQuery, which we're going to talk a little bit about today, um, and a lot of great projects that you may know and love. So when you think about the challenges that sort of face us um, in the JavaScript world, um, we have a little bit of a, a bright, shiny penny problem. Because again, you can use JavaScript and AI in the metaverse, but if you think about where is you know, all of the excitement and I think the hype, as Lynn has talked about this morning, it's, you know, people are definitely talking about AI and others. Um, so if you think about it, the, you know, AI and some of the cloud native, it does really capture the lion's, sh <coughs> the lion's share of financial support. Um, and it's kind of like the famous projects get a lot of the support. Um, and when you think about why that is, or kind of some of the problems that causes, is, um, is when you have you know, projects like ours, and of course Node.js is famous, but a lot of it is led by volunteers. I would say it's one of the truly community-led projects we have. Um, but with community-led projects and that sort of that notion of volunteerism, you get a lot of maintainer burnout. And when you have maintainer burnout, that's when sort of bugs and some security issues can come in. Um, you have with uncompensated contributors, um, oftentimes the contributors you do have are working on uh, new features, but you may not have like that great specific expertise like in security and others. Um, so we do have a lot of maintainers who are completely overwhelmed by a lot of companies who are putting demand on our maintainers, um, but giving very little back to our projects. Um, and if you take a look at our 35 projects just under our roof, we have 150,000 contributors across all those projects. Um, and kind of over half of them are unaffiliated with any company. So if you, you know, if, I don't know if any of you read uh, some research from Tidelift, um, and they found um, about 60% of, of maintainers are still volunteers. Um, and I think that's sort of what the case we're finding with our, our world as well. Um, I don't know if you all know Darcy Clark, who used to be at NPM and GitHub running the CLI tool and now has Volt. But he, he's uh, done a presentation uh, a few times and has lent me a few slides that I really like to use. Um, how many of you all know NPM? Probably everybody, so I don't have to explain. Um, but yeah, the largest software registry in our world particular, and it's also mirrored in many other countries, including China. Um, yeah, just the impact, 3.2 million uh, packages, 19 billion downloads, um, and a lot of those are through our projects. Um, and then if you th take a look at JavaScript, we have a lot of dependencies, like a ton more than the others that you see compared to an average of 10. So, and why does that matter? It matters because, gosh, 75% of vulnerabilities reside in those dependencies. So again, sort of huge risk there. Um, and if you also look at sort of supply chain security, 
Uh, one of the most basic uh, indicators um, to measure that is the quantity of malicious packages. Um, and according to some research by reversing labs, we had 11,000 packages, uh, malicious packages were detected across all three platforms, um, NPM, uh, PyPy, and RubyGems. And that's a 28% increase over 2022. So it's not getting better, folks. And if you take a look at what kind of secrets are turning up in some of these platforms, um, if you take a look at Node, uh, Reversing Labs data showed that embedded um, and encrypted private keys made up more than a third of all of the uh, discovered secrets, uh, with web services uh, access keys accounting for 14%. Um, and here's another sort of supply chain issue we face is there's a lot of people who are not patching JavaScript bugs. And part of it could be the resources and that volunteerism we talked about. Um, a lot of it is what we are calling the car alarm. People just hit ignore, 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 and you really don't really think it's anything severe. Um, so if you take a look at that, JavaScript is second behind Java. I mean, of course, JavaScript has tons of packages for many small functions. So we kind of have a wide surface, a surface area. Um, and, you know, security researchers will say that Java and JavaScript are the most targeted ecosystems for supply chain attacks. So we have a lot of data showing the, import the importance and the risk of the JavaScript ecosystem. Um, and op at OpenJS, what did we decide to do? We decided to do more research in particular. Um, and we partnered with IDC and Al Gillen, who you may know, Al is... Uh, very much an expert um, in open source developers. He actually just retired, so this is one of his last projects he did with us, which is pretty cool. Um, and what we found is really the global web infrastructure is in a really precarious position. Um, last Halloween, we announced really how scary it is with three quarters of a billion websites um, are out of date, with most capturing personal and financial information. So really, PII is at risk in, in these websites. So the IDC research surveyed more than 500 people in 23 industries across North America, UK, and Europe, representing small, medium, and large organizations. Um, surprisingly, over one third of the respondents confirmed having experienced a security incident in the last 24 months. So here's some more findings from IDC. Um, and when we took a look at jQuery, we, we took a look at jQuery because jQuery is in 77% of the world's website. So for us, it's that tip of the iceberg. It's the canary in the coal mine. So if you're using old jQuery, you're probably using old everything else. Um, and so we found that 89% um, are using it. Again, we're capturing the financial um, and personal information. Um, and, and customers who took the survey through IDC you know, talked about the loss of customers and the revenue loss that they experienced. Um, and of course, security is the number one reason for upgrade. Um, and, you know, another interesting thing we discovered from uh, this research is they actually acknowledged that jQuery was not the cause of their security incident. Um, but what we found is um, by using old and outdated software, which again is sort of the, inter the plague um, that we're talking about for the internet. If they're using old software, that also means they probably have uh, old or non-existent like processes, security processes, to keep their software uh, patched um, and updated. Um, and if you kind of take a look at jQuery, part of it is some of the adoption. Like it, you know, jQuery is you know what 17 years old. It um, it was is widely implemented in Bootstrap in WordPress, so there's broad adoption there. Uh, WordPress is, is great now because all of the new versions are shipped with uh, updated, but still there's a lot of old websites out there as we saw. Um, and easy, even as our jQuery team do, does do make fixes, they're really a small team of volunteers um, who just have been there for years and years um, and just really kind of struggle to keep up. So uh, what, uh, one more little data point and you'll see, oops, let's see. And you'll find this in some of our other projects. Almost two thirds of people are using old jQuery today. 
which is pretty consistent with some of the other data that you see on the web on, you can find, you know, people who are using which technology. So this kind of hit home. So good news, you might be current, and the bad news, you might not be. Uh, we also took a look at why you should be upgrading. Um, of course, new, you know, community projects are great. They're updated all the time. Um, it's wonderful. It's important to, t to pay attention to that. We'll talk a little bit more about that. New features come along, security, um, and, you know, just the, the rapid uh, release of new projects are just uh, much more uh, um, advanced than you'll find in commercial software. So today you may have seen uh, that we launched a new website to see if you have old jQuery. Again, tip of the iceberg. Uh, it's called healthyweb.org. You can go there right now and check some of your favorite websites and see if you have old jQuery or not. I had a couple pulled up that, um, that will tell if, you are, if your website's healthy, if your website has poor health, or if your website's not using jQuery. Um, and then the jQuery maintainers put together a lot of great resources to make it easy to upgrade if you're, if you're doing so. Um, and this is sort of the start of a, camp, a public education campaign. We're looking uh, to partner with anybody and everybody from public and private sector to get people to moderni modernize their software. Has anybody typed in their favorite URL and found anything yet? No? jQuery.com is healthy. But I won't shame anybody publicly, but it's, uh, it's pretty interesting to see. But again, it's not just jQuery. Uh, a lot of our communities are alarmed that you all are just not upgrading your software. Um, Node.js, if you're not updating Node.js, you are putting yourself and your company at risk. Um, you know, I don't know if you all know about the Node shipping. They ship twice a year. Uh, they have even and odd numbers. The odd is sort of the experimental, the even is stable. Uh, that's the calendar. We'll be having Node 22 coming out next week. Spoiler alert. That shouldn't be a spoiler if you follow GitHub. Um, but, you know, there is a, a very formulaic process. This team has been shipping every six months since 2015. Very reliable. So, but again, what's shocking is these are uh, from Node 16 on. Y'all should not be using Node 16 prior. Uh, massively popular from adoption. Uh, they all have known vulnerabilities. They're um, unsupported. We've been very clear about that, and folks are not upgrading. So we're trying to get more folks to upgrade. Um, Node was downloaded 2 billion times last year. That's just last year. So go back you know, to 2015 or even prior. There's a lot of people using old Node.js. A little more complicated to do a little checker for Node. Uh, Rafael Gonzaga, who runs our security collaboration space, our security working group on Node, has, has built a really cool tool. You can check it out. Is my Node vulnerable? It will tell you what version are you on and if you're all good or if you're in, in danger. So I encourage you to take a look at that. Um, and if you think about holistically at the foundation, you know, we have something called collaboration spaces, which is kind of, I call it our JavaScripty term for working groups because we think it's more inclusive. Um, and we've been like really all in on security for the past few years. We were the first uh, project foundation through Alpha Omega to get a grant for the Node.js project. We're on our third year. We got Alpha Omega grants for uh, jQuery as well. Um, if you look at Node, they didn't even have a, an active uh, security working group before Alpha Omega that provided a paid full-time resource uh, to the Node project. Uh, same with jQuery, paid resources, uh, uh, paid research for us to really understand. So as we talk about those sort of volunteers, sometimes getting that expertise in security is really difficult. And boots on the ground has been pretty effective for us uh, to get things done. Um, we also um, have uh, received funding from the Sovereign Tech Fund from the German government. I essentially say it, it doubled our budget. We're kind of like one of the probably most underfunded foundations, I say, um, at the Linux Foundation from that bright, shiny object thing. So we've done um, a lot of uh, 
amazing things there. We've, um, I think I have a slide on it, so I'll talk a little bit more. Um, so there's obviously, we all know that the Open Source Security Foundation, OpenSSF, is, is really setting you know, the bar on the best practices for the industry. Um, but again, we talked about overwhelmed, um, um, our overwhelmed maintainers. They can't go through all of that content. So we're taking all of the OpenSSF documentation, best practices and guidance, and we're customizing that for JavaScript. And sometimes it, I'd say 99% of it is sort of relevant. Sometimes it's not always so. And so we're prioritizing what can projects do. Uh, we have a full-time uh, security uh, engineering champion who are, who's helping our projects. They're onboarding them onto a scorecard, um, any security incidents they're having to get them, um, you know, to help them and to get some processes in place. Um, we're also creating a security, a free JavaScript security training with Faras Sabuka DJ, who you may know at Socket. So that will be coming out later this year. Um, and then also important to security is sort of the stability of our infrastructure. And if you can imagine a lot of our projects, they're quite old. Um, a lot of the key infrastructure pieces have been um, developed over time with sort of like handshake deals with maintainers over time and just dozens of vendors. So we've been doing sort of an inventory and analysis of all of the infrastructure pieces, uh, kind of consolidating that um, onto a few vendors who have been graciously providing uh, free support for us, like Fastly, DigitalOcean, Cloudflare, and more. And uh, we're going to move that to the Linux Foundation IT department, who are quite skilled to help um, our projects uh, manage the infrastructure, but not just manage it, just to kind of like, like, so they don't even have to worry about it, just remove the friction of managing that infrastructure for their projects. Um, and in addition to our, here's some of the work on our collaboration spaces, we'll have a number of work streams and you'll see kind of an example. Um, again, that's in our GitHub repo. Um, and you'll see right now that there's the secure releases and CVE management best practices for JavaScript um, and best practices badging guidance. Um, we've been doing a lot of, uh, having a lot of discussions on SBOMs, not a lot of uh, consensus yet, so that's evolving. Um, so, you know, really, if, if this is something you're interested, we really need more points of view. We have folks uh, from small companies, big companies. We have um, every sort of point of view is great on how folks uh, use and experience JavaScript. Um, and you may have read or saw Jim Zemlin's uh, keynote yesterday on something uh, that has been sort of quite alarming and sort of hit our world uh, last week. Um, about the social engineering takeovers. Um, this is, uh, you know, this is where I think the foundation really ha has shines. We have a cross-project council, um, which is like our technical oversight committee. And I always say it's better together. We have representatives from the projects. We have representatives from the community. Anybody can be in the CPC. You don't have to work on one of our projects, but if you're um, interested in participating, you can just come participate in a couple of months, be it an official member of the CPC. Um, and um, what had happened is uh, one of our projects had been receiving a series of emails over the past uh, several months. It was going to a moderated email alias that we didn't see, um, but somebody who was copied on it saw, and it was, probably would have not triggered their spidey sense had it not been for the XZ utils uh, attack. Um, so once that happened, um, our team just sort of went into motion, um, notified CISA, who was amazing, um, and just joined the partner program under CISA. And again, when you see Better Together in open source and just watching that, uh, that work over the past week and a half has been, has been really amazing. Um, but it's, it's pretty scary. Um, we like to say, you know, and again, we're a foundation built on trust. We have 150,000 contributors, but we're also really excellent in the forms of governance structures that we, uh, that we put in place with the projects or that the projects put in place with the guidance of the CPC. So there are different levels of commit access. Uh, we do a lot of uh, things to connect our contributors as well. Um, we don't have it all figured out. Identity will be big. Um, and so our security collaboration space is going to be working with the industry and try to figure out how to really get ahead of this as well. 
um, and just make sure all of our projects have that sort of extra security sort of fortification that we need. So had that, you know, potential takeover been executed, which it was not, um, that we would have security measures in place that would make it more difficult to, to cause harm. So. Um, I talked a little bit about the node, uh, about the node work with Alpha Omega. Last year we blogged every month, we're doing about every other month. Um, uh, really a lot of cool things uh, happening in that space. Um, and so um, what was really interesting is to watch that group grow. Um, people didn't, you know, didn't know that they can just come and contribute to Node. We've been trying to explain that you know, Node is so big and there's so many working groups. Some of our other projects too, like Electron, there's so many different ways you can get involved. And if you have the security expertise, you're absolutely welcome to join that group. They put together permissions models, uh, threat, you know, threat policies, um, and they've automated a lot of the uh, security releases that they've done. There's 26 steps. It used to take like 700 hours, I think, to do a security release, and now that's getting quite automated. So we've really seen great results with that, with that work. Um, yeah, here's some more details. Um, and you'll see actually on their repo, the, the best practices guide, I talked about the automation, uh, the dependency vulnerability checks. Um, so yeah, a lot of great work. You could check out our blog and see some of that, and so you'll see more coming. Um, so, uh, you know, one of my favorite case studies, I don't know if you all know Steve Husak, he's been pretty active in the open source communities at Capital One. Um, they, they've really set a best practice on how they update their, uh, their node, not only Node.js, but everything. It's engineering and it's OSPO, and they've really set up a JavaScript center of excellence um, and are very quite de deliberate in how they, um, and how they upgrade and test. And we have a case study on our, on our website. We have a video with Steve talking about it. Um, and he talked about some of his best, the best practices that, that they deploy. Um, and I think what's really interesting about not only the way Capital One um, implements internally is to see how Capital One gives back. And it's not just membership. Steve is active in the Cross Project Council. He's active in our security collaboration space. And having sort of that end user point of view, a regulated industry point of view has been really sort of critical. Um, and so um, it's you know, definitely worth, you know, if you had 20 minutes to listen to a case study on how best to implement uh, a modernization and upgrade plan within your, your company. Uh, I think that Steve and Capital One's team is sort of like gold star for sure. Um, so, you know, we're thinking about the takeaway, and I've been thinking about the takeaway too, just on just the overwhelming nature of what happened with the social engineering and so many dependencies. Um, and, you know, I think we all know sort of some of who are the most critical projects. You know, of course, we have hundreds, but if you look at like the top 30 NPM downloads, if you look across sort of the Linux Foundation, um, I think we do need to do sort of a better job of just holistically taking a look at the most critical projects. I know Alpha Omega has been doing that with their criticality store, uh, criticality score, and just understanding that where we need to invest more broadly. Um, again, some of these, you know, the the cool kid projects that get tons of funding, that's great. But we have cool kids working in the not so famous projects at OpenJS who really need your support and funding as well. Um, because again, the, the, the risk is high um, and we take you know, that responsibility quite seriously. Um, and so here's a number of ways you can kind of collaborate with us. We have a new website, our, calen our public calendar. All of our meetings are streamed live on YouTube. Um, we have a YouTube channel. If you wanna check it out, uh, you're welcome to join, lurk, participate. Um, our Slack channel is open as well. You can join. Um, and so that's what I have. I was wondering if anyone had any questions. I'm here to answer. Any questions? Great. Great.
Well, thanks, everyone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.